uh, welcome to the Institute to Human for Humanities Research. Uh, this is our final event for fall 2023. And we're really happy to have this because often we promote grants, but what many humanities faculty need is time. They need time to think, time to work with others in the community, to think with others, and to develop out their ideas uh, in community and in conversation. So this is about how to both apply for fellowships and what to do if you get one, how to best use some of your time. And so with us are two people who know a lot about that. Uh, it's Joy Conley, is the president of the American Council of Learned Societies since 2019, and was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2021. Her interest in progressive transformation derives from her scholarship and her administrative experience. She is author of two books, The State of Speech, and the life of Roman republicanism, and over 70 articles, book reviews, and essays. Her writings have appeared in New York Times Book Review, The Independent, The Village Voice, Times Literary Supplement, The Chronicle of Higher Education, and Inside Higher Ed. She speaks and writes regularly about the future of humanities and the necessity of public funding for higher education as a keystone to a, ro a robust democracy. Absolutely. And Robert Newman, unfortunately, could not be here with us in person today, uh, is, is a little under the weather, but we're happy to have him virtually via Zoom. And he has promised to come see us in person, uh, perhaps over the next academic year. So Robert is president and director of the National Humanities Center. We has significantly raised the NHC's profile in the United States and internationally created new innovative programs to support humanities scholars and educators at every level, and reinforced the center's standing as a leader in addressing contemporary concerns through humanistic thinking. His scholarship has focused on 20th century English and American literature and culture and narrative theory. He has published six books, over 100 articles, reviews and poems, and has given talks throughout the world. He has received awards not only for his scholarship, but also for his institutional leadership and teaching. Please help me in welcoming Joy and Robert today. So by way of format, I should say, so Joy will speak for about 10, 15 minutes about the work they do at ACLS. Robert will speak for a bit, then there'll be an opportunity for both uh, cross-talk conversation and Q&A. Great, thank you. Can everybody hear me? The mic is on. I want to make sure Robert can hear me. Great, good. Uh, thank you again so much for having me and everyone. I've had the gift of time, your time already. Speaking of time, I know how precious it is uh, for all the reasons uh, that were just mentioned. And, and I'm so grateful to have had the chance to meet you and especially spent time this morning at the Botanical Garden, which I'm not going to mention the person who said he hasn't been here yet in his time here. Um, but uh, if you haven't been, you've got to go. It's just uh, I found my mind going in a million directions. It's such a productive, generative space to be among, among those trees and plants and breathing that air. So thank you for that opportunity uh, to come. So today I'm going to use, um, I, I'm going to cheat a little. I shouldn't say that. Um, I, I'm going to talk absolutely about our fellowship and grant programs, but, but one of our main um, pillars, if I can use that kind of McKinsey-ish language uh, for just a moment. One of the main pillars of our work at ACLS is to see that the production and generation and circulation or, and, and co-creation of knowledge is integrally wrapped up these days, especially in the humanities and social sciences, with strengthening the infrastructure um, of, of academia, um, with humanizing it, with um, calling to attention and taking action on those aspects of humanistic infrastructure and professional evaluation uh, when it comes to faculty reward structure, what re we require of the PhD, um, the way we distribute knowledge in disciplines and departments, um, and the way we structure undergraduate majors. So all the kind of, you know, we could call it policing or gatekeeping, we could call it the organizing or generation of knowledge. 
all of these things are intimately bound up with the way we do our work and its success and its meaning and its impact. So for that reason, I want to take the opportunity, and this is what I mean by cheat, um, not just talk about our fellowship and grants programs specifically, but the ways in which they fit into um, the way I've tried to expand ACLS's footprint in the, in the world um, and use the amazing relationships we have um, to try to uh, not tell people what to do, because that's not a, the way academia works, as I know from my experience as provost and acting president, but it, it isn't the way it should work anyway. Um, and an ACLS really is in a way a bully pulpit and an ampli amplifier of the kinds of things that you want to do. I mean, that's really what I see it. We are um, really a, um, a service organization in, the, in that best possible sense. So, um, so that's why you're going to hear a little bit, I wanted to explain why uh, you're going to hear a bit about our other programs. But to me, they really are uh, tightly connected doesn't even begin to explain it. I mean, they're really kind of all part of the same. So I will move from this unbelievably boring slide to, now I have to find where the clicker is supposed to go. Aha, okay. So I, I'm gonna talk about ACLS, who we are, what we do, and then I'll move to the fellowship and grants and we'll have a, some time for questions. Oops, sorry, I haven't quite found the sweet spot. Okay, um, so who are we? Uh, I thought it was worth saying. We've been around for about a century. Um, we're a, a federation of now 80. We're growing a little bit every year, and this is by um, design, because at the moment, the membership um, in ACLS of the, of the academic professional societies, the learned societies in the parlance of a century ago, um, is a little behind the times. We don't have the ethnic studies representation we want. Um, we don't have the um, re representation from emerging areas of envir uh, environmental humanities, medical humanities. Um, I would love to see more engagement with the space of urban studies and architecture, uh, which I see as a crucial area for lived environment and thinking about climate change and city life and, and rural life and everything in between. So we have more work to do in this area, but we are growing a little bit each year um, in terms of our representation uh, among societies. Um, our mission is, uh, as you see it here, and our communities at the bottom, I'll have a little bit to say about now. So scholars, and forgive the alliteration, it does help me when I'm doing this though, when I'm talking about ACLS, scholars, schools, societies, and systems change. And I'll just say that among my colleagues, ACLS is about 40 people. We're very small, um, at least having been at CUNY, I think of it as very, very small. Uh, uh, that we, it, it, when asked to explain it, what ACLS does and what it is, like on a plane or a train, you know, who can get it down to below 15 minutes? It's a, it's a real challenge, because we do many different things. So here's a slide that tries to show as I said, we're in the middle of a lot of flows um, and a lot of ideas and a lot of really amazing work and people. So um, here you see in the middle are schools and systems, scholars and societies. Um, and this is a little bit of an overview and I won't talk about every single one of these, uh, but I wanted, I, I, we designed this visual so you could see how our fellowship of course, you know, support scholars directly. They also support schools um, directly and indirectly, uh, but, in terms of, of the societies, uh, those, of course, that overlaps with scholars, we're in regular consultation with our society members so that we're, we have our ears open to hear how we should fundraise. Um, and this is an opportunity for me to say to you that um, although we have, and I think I may have this actually on in a couple of slides, but I'll come back to that. Um, Although we have a, a, a wonderful endowment, thanks to the efforts of my predecessors, it's currently um, at about $170 million, which depending on where you are is either pathetically tiny or <laughs> amazingly wonderful. Um, and I'm more in the pathetically tiny end because my job is to, to, to make it as big as I can as long as I'm at ACLS. But, um, but that, we, we, that funds, that endowment funds about 20% of the fellowships and grants we award each year, which have gone between, um, on, an, on an annual basis, between 20 and $30 million over the last, uh, over the last uh, 10 years, we'll say. Uh, the 
the remainder of that, 80%, is foundation driven almost entirely. And we over rely, as many humanities people do, on the Mellon Foundation, I will say. Um, and I mean that in a good way. I mean, they're generous. Our relationship with them is very good. Um, but we are seeking to diversify it and to that end um, are reaching out more and more assertively to organizations, funders that fund the social sciences, the sciences, schools of public policy, law, public health, because so many of you are doing work that impacts those, you know, that, that, that's, uh, that rests squarely in those areas. And we see a massive uh, need for to change the narrative when it comes to those funders so that they understand the amazing humanistic work that's going on that has societal impact or that is studying issues like, and I point you to um, Rebecca Walkowitz, Dean for uh, the Humanities at Rutgers, wrote a great piece in the Chronicle a couple months ago about the value of language study um, and language research and, literature and literary research as underpinning deep understanding of how human beings communicate. So just this is just to kind of say rest assured, um, if, if, uh, if you were concerned when I go to these science and social science and public policy organizations, I don't just wave the flag of societal impact, but also the, the deep impact of work that we would call, um, I think, traditional or foundational humanistic research. That also plays a role in my pitch. So um, just two quick thoughts, and I'll leave this slide. Um, I wanted to show you the array of programs we, we, um, we fund. The Intention Foundry, I'll call out a major um, diversity and equity justice inclusion initiative. It's funded by the Mellon Foundation. It directly engages um, scholars of color, emerging scholars from the societies in conversation with their executive directors about advancing fields and moving them forward, um, making them more equitable, making them more creative and ambitious. Um, and that, uh, that program is run for three years and it's moving to a second phase now. And I'll lastly call out the, um, the design workshop, which is closely connected to the Leadership Institute for a New Academy. The full name of the design workshop is the Loose Design Workshop for a New Academy. This brought together teams from six um, to talk to solve the problem. We hired a design thinking consultant who brought us through a brutal, fast, um, you know, timed exercises. If you've ever done design thinking, you know, 60 seconds, going to figure out how do you solve uh, the problem of the, uh, the decrease in enrollments and the decrease in visibility, decrease in funding at many places. ASU is an outlier um, when it comes to the human social sciences. So we had uh, intergenerational kind of multi-sector teams and they had to involve a dean, uh, a chair, a tenure track faculty member, at least one non-tenure track faculty member, at least one graduate student, and I think an assistant professor. Um, and, and one of the insights I just wanted to share there was that in our thinking about fellowships and grants designs, we have also found that multi-generational discussion really crucial because uh, it, it, it's important to get everybody in a room and hear one another comment uh, on the kind of fun, uh, the, the, the shape of funding, the shape of need, partly because if an assistant professor thinks that they need something, it's very useful to have a dean or a senior faculty member say, ah, you think you need that, but you actually might also need that, you know, so having, we don't have enough spaces for intergenerational conversation in the academy, and that's why I call out that. So I just want to give you a sense of the ways in which we're trying to strengthen academic and make more equitable the academic infrastructure. Um, here are our communities, our council, um, I already I mentioned our societies, our research university consortium, of which I'm happy to say ASU is a member, and we're really lucky to have you. We have a larger, kind of looser network with over 200 institutions and then cohorts of fellows and participants in our programs. So now I'll turn to those fellowship programs for the last few minutes. Um, in last year, we had 13 different fellowship and grant programs. Um, you can see the size of the operation that my colleagues in US programs and international programs run. Uh, I'm gonna give you here a, um, a selection, I emphasize the and this is not the whole overview, um, but a selection of some of our, of some of our most popular programs. Uh, the ACLS Fellowship is funded by our endowment, as uh, that I referred to earlier. 
currently, um, and this is, we predict the last year in which this will be the case, we uh, have made that since COVID only for scholars without tenure. Um, right now, literally, this week and next week and the coming weeks, um, my colleague, the director of US programs, is cogitating with a couple of advisory groups about how best to open up the central fellowship, as we call it, the ACLS fellowship, um, again, to scholars with tenure. So that will likely happen. It's not a promise, but it'll likely happen in next year's competition, the 2024-25 competition. Um, you can see the shape of the fellowship. I won't belabor all these institutions, these uh, these elements, only to say that the eligibility requirements have expanded over the last four years. We've been uh, we've tried to make an, a special outreach. Uh, to people of, um, of you know, various citizen and residency statuses um, and make it clear that we welcome uh, independent scholars as well and that our, you can take our fellowship anywhere. A couple of other programs and then I'll turn to making best use of the fellowship. Um, this is our latest faculty fellowship that we opened just this year, um, a new program. It's a pilot uh, funded to the amount of about three quarters of a million dollars for the next for th each year for the next three years. Um, the one thing I want to underline here, by way of getting your input in the session now or, or after, um, is that we're exploring here flexible support, um, and this is in response to HBCU faculty telling us, and, and they're not alone. Um, and I think there are people, uh, scholars like this, in all kinds of institutions, including elite R ones, uh, that they want maximum flexibility like three funded summers, they want to be able to use the money for anything, uh, that, uh, that the kind of old shape of taking a year off um, is not possible for some people or, and not, or not desirable. So we tried to respond to that with this fellowship. And we're thinking already about how we might import that approach uh, to other, uh, other programs. So here's our doctoral support. We're really lucky and fortunate and grateful to Mellon for continuing to fund the Dissertation Innovation Fellowship, which now falls in the middle of graduate student career, um, not at the end, as our old Dissertation Completion Fellowship did. Um, we have uh, ongoing the Leading Edge Fellowship, which is a, uh, a kind of successor, not kind of, it is a successor program to the ACLS Mellon Public Fellows, which was a program that ran for, I think, 13 years and really pioneered um, I think I can say, sorry, I shouldn't use that word. I take that back. It explored um, and, and stood as, uh, I think, a great source of inspiration and hope uh, for young scholars who were not finding, I mean, professionally young scholars, who were not finding uh, places or want places. This places people in nonprofits of different kinds. Okay, I'm going to go on. So um, I will just draw your attention to a couple of our international fellowships and encourage you um, to look at those and our digital justice grants and our other, um, other programs that are on our website. As I said, please stay tuned because you'll find information about opening up the Central Fellowship, the ACLS Fellowship to, to scholars with tenure. And then other programs, my, a big part of my job is um, beating the bushes of, among foundations for more funding for new programs. So. Um, it's my hope that you will find more to read about in, in coming years. Um, in terms of uh, the, uh, the application and the review process, and, and here I'm really going to go right to the tips because this is all fairly, yeah, um, this is all kind of common sense. But um, I'm sure Robert will talk about this too. I mean, we, we, uh, my colleagues have spent a ton of time and effort to developing resources, webinars, um, you know, lots of information that we've we've talked to applicants and we've said to we've asked them, what do you need from the information about current and recent fellows that helps you apply? So that's been curated in a sense. Really strongly recommend that you go use the website. And if you don't find something you need or if you know, God forbid, of an organization that does it better than we do, don't hesitate to tell us so that we can mount, you know, more information that will help you. Um, there's also information on writing. Um, applications and, um, and improving your drafts. So this is the last, uh, last slide. It's essentially look at the website. Remember that every piece counts. We've put also, and I say we, really my colleagues in U.S. programs and international programs have put a, a lot of work into making the application accessible, which is to say streamlined. Um, we don't ask for OTO's information, at least not to our reviewers. Uh, and we ask really that 
you remember uh, that we value uh, transdisciplinary impact and communication. So you're not just writing for an audience of people in your specialty and you know, keep the language clear, keep it accessible, keep it dynamic, uh, and test with an audience of friends. It's the best thing to do before hitting apply. Um, and then apply. Don't, don't uh, let the numbers turn you away. It is extremely competitive. I mean, I'm not going to lie to you. Every program is. Um, but um, but the, the higher the numbers, you know, makes me go out there and fundraise um, to, to supply more awards. Uh, and we see good work. We also encourage, we see good work get rejected. We also encourage reapplications. So when, in terms of making use of it, just a quick word, because I'm going to pass it over to Robert. Um, however you want to do that. I would just say, when I'm, I'm now really drawing on my experience as a dean and provost when I had that inevitable conversation, almost inevitable conversation with people in like February, March, April, who had come to my office, who had been on leave and I hadn't seen them. And I'm just like, oh, what, what are you doing here? You should be away working on your whatever. And they would sit down and say, I, I just, I feel like the year is gone and I haven't done anything and I haven't made any progress. I spent you know, August, September, October being exhausted and recovering from my busy work of the prior years. I get going and then the holidays hit and the kids are uh, and then January and I tried to get started and now it's March and I haven't done anything and what am I going to do? So coming out of those conversations, I would say um, if you can create a writing group, a small writing group, um, and this is something we're experimenting with setting up. Robert already does this because he has the great advantage of a residential center, but we're experimenting with setting up uh, virtual cohorts. Figure out check-ins, you know, commit to a departmental presentation, um, or you have amazing centers and institutes here that will welcome your, um, you know, welcome hearing about your work. Schedule it before you start the fellowship because then you're stuck. <laughs> you got to stand up and present. Um, and, uh, and between that and any external invitations, you can, you know, you can accept just to keep yourself moving. And that I know that's so common sense and so basic, you may just laugh me out of the room, but it is the most important piece of feedback we hear from, from scholars who make the most of their year, that they take some time ahead of time, keep them moving in a pathetic but encouraging way, and some public presentations. So, oops, I'm afraid I have now taken my 15 minutes. So. <laughs> Shall I, shall I take questions now or pass it over to Robert? Hey. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, I'm so sorry I can't be there. Um, I'm a little honest about the spring we have a future, so I will hold into that. Uh, I'm particularly jealous that Joy got to go to the Botanical Garden. I was looking forward to that as well. Um, let me start by sharing my screen and playing a brief video clip to sort of describe the center for you. And this should work. Ah, it's beautiful. 
Okay. Beautiful. So we are in our 45th year. Uh, we open the doors to the beautiful Blackster building that you saw in the video. Uh, that sits in the woods in the Research Triangle Park in North Carolina in 1978. We're the world's only independent institution that's ex exclusively devoted to advanced research in the humanities. Um, we are granted in a few shared convictions that scholarship is vitally important to society, that the best scholarship is done in conditions of ideal freedom and support, and that an independent, privately funded institute can provide those conditions more effectively than any other kind of institution. Since 1978, we've had about 1,500 fellows that have spent time uh, at the center, and collectively, they produce somewhere around 1,700 books. Those books have won all the major prizes, Pulitzer Prizes, National Book Awards, Bancroft Prizes, all the major disciplinary prizes. Um, and um, if you uh, look at our, our list of fellows, it's kind of a who's who of leading names in humanities scholarship over the years. We've been uh, a deeply productive agent in humanistic disciplines in three major ways. So the very existence of the National Humanities Center lends dignity and stature to the humanistic enterprise. And this is increasingly rare, and it's quite intentional. The National Humanities Center also provides humanists with an awareness of the convictions and the connections between disciplines that departmental structures of universities often obscure. And also, the center creates an intimate community for scholars who famously work alone. Uh, so I'm going to echo some of what Joyce said to you um, and focus more on the fact that we are a residential program. Um, we have also, as part of our mission, a remarkable education program uh, that provides online materials, webinars, various institutes that reach 3 million public school teachers, K-12, uh, community college teachers annually. Uh, the materials are vetted and the webinars are conducted by former fellows so they have a scholarly credibility that's really unparalleled. And we're very, very involved, increasingly involved, in public outreach and advocacy for the humanities, combating a lot of the misinformation that's out there and the misaligned rhetoric about the humanities. We also have a number of uh, summer programs and various programs for our institutional sponsors, of which ASU is, is one. So we offer podcast institutes. We offer a teaching and learning institute for PhD students in the humanities. We have a one-month June summer residency. We have a responsible AI project, and we have a number of uh, other projects as well uh, that we welcome um, your involvement with. Our library services, as was indicated in that video, are really unparalleled. Um, when fellows arrive, we have tried already to create their home offices for them. So we ask them to send us a bibliography before they arrive. And then we line all the books up alphabetically so they don't have to bring anything with them. Um, and during the course of the year, uh, any requests that they make, they simply send to via an email to the librarians. And we do our best to have that request uh, on their desk within 24 hours. We have runners daily to the uh, libraries at UNC, at Duke, at NC State, and our interlibrary loan possibilities are just endless. We, in the surveys at the end of the year, our fellows tell us that uh, these include fellows from uh, the best libraries in the world, Oxford, Harvard, Yale. They tell us that our librarians have found things for them that their librarians for five years have not been able to. What we intend to do is <clears throat> provide uh, an atmosphere that's conducive for focusing entirely on getting a lot of writing done, getting the project um, near completion or moving it along substantially. So one of the things that we do is we find, we help the, the fellows find really nice housing, usually, usually in Durham or Chapel Hill. A lot of it's sabbatical housing, but we've worked with a number of landlords over the years. Um, People like to live in Chapel Hill if they have kids because the schools are wonderful. Door was kind of the up and coming town with the fantastic cutting edge restaurant scene and theater and all kinds of music venues. And we're very close to Wally as well. Um, 
We also attempt to feed our fellows extremely well. We have a full-time cook, and we also have a full-time baker. So I will say that again, we have a full-time baker. Um, and we joke about the fellows 15, which is about the number of pounds that they ate during the course of the year, but we have lots of walking trails around the center also. And we have an absolutely fabulous coffee machine, so there's just, uh, and we buy fantastic beans, so there you can energize yourself uh, continuously during the day. The building is open to four fellows 24-7. You have a key to the building if you like to work late at night, early in the morning, uh, whatever your hours, weekends, etc. You can use your office whenever you wish. And during the last couple of years, we have worked with our fellows to really help better publicize their work, and when they leave, we continue to publicize their work and work with them to advance their careers. Uh, we have a robust public lecture series that features some of our fellows. We have a virtually popular podcast series in which I interview fellows about their work during the course of the year, and increasingly we have a number of people uh, on their treadmills or walking the dog in the morning, and they tune into our podcasts. We help our fellows develop their personal web pages and work with them to keep those pages active after they leave. Um, we, as I said, try to keep current with their activities and their accomplishments and publicize them broadly. And the network of colleagues and speakers that we bring in for various events, for lunchtime seminars, also contribute to the intellectual vitality of the fellowship year and to future career success. We bring in directors of university presses, we bring in directors of trade presses for those that wish to write for a broader audience. Uh, we bring in all kinds of acquisition editors that uh, are seeking uh, really wonderful material uh, also. Um, we have lots and lots of activities where we're working with fellows uh, to in, uh, enhance their ability to podcast or to improve their social media skills or to teach them about new digital advances and skills they can use in their scholarship or in the classroom. But all of these activities are strictly voluntary. We don't require anything of our fellows except that they work on their projects and that they all have lunch together. Um, and that, that is the only requirement they have, uh, essentially to have lunch together to work on their projects. Uh, and what I try to emphasize at the beginning of the year during orientation is that the academic year that they're spending at the center or the semester, depending on um, uh, whether they come for a semester only or for a full academic year, it will be the freest they will ever be in their entire academic careers. Uh, I emphasize this story at the beginning of the year of the orientation, and I ask them to embrace their freedom and to really get involved in the intellectual community, which is crucial to their success and crucial for a successful residential fellowship. Uh, over and over again, I hear after the project is initially published, how important those lunchtime conversations were. Uh, someone working in 14th century French history is talking to somebody who's working uh, in 18th century British art. And they have an amazing conversation. Somebody, and one, one says to the other, have you seen this painting or read this book or looked at this article? And it, the uh, project takes a turn. And it takes a, a very positive turn and it deepens. We also emphasize to our fellows that they should learn how to say no to outside <laughs> distractions. They are there to get their work done. So they are free from teaching, they are free from university politics and departmental considerations. Um, if they get invited to speak elsewhere, it's up to them if they choose to accept or not, but we encourage them to say no more often than saying yes and really do embrace the freedom to focus entirely on the project and to think it's a right. So there's a lot of information on our website. There's frequently uh, asked questions, but essentially the applications are due every year in early October. During the past few years, we've averaged about five to 600 proposals from all over the world for around 35 spaces. Sometimes it's 34, sometimes it's 36, but usually we have about in the neighborhood of 35 fellowships. These are all supported through our endowment. Uh, we have scholars from all over the US and several 
who come from non-U.S. countries, including recently China, Singapore, Argentina, Nigeria, Brazil, the U.K., Greece. And if space is available, we also try to make accommodations for what we call resident associates. These are partners, spouses, uh, who are also scholars who are working on a scholarly project. And if we accept them as residential or resident associates, we treat them exactly as we treat the fellows. They have all the advantages, all the services, except they don't get a stipend. Uh, we also, in the applications and the selection, consider the humanities very broadly. And we have scholars from fields like anthropology, or history, political theory, archaeology, law, history of science, film, uh, and many, many others. The process simply, in terms of selection, goes like this. All eligible proposals, and the proposal by eligible means it has to be at least a second book project and not a dissertation project. Um, they go to three external reviewers in the discipline. Many of whom are former fellows who, once they have spent a year with us, will do anything we ask of them. Uh, we use about 550 reviewers annually. Um, and based on the evaluation scores from the three external reviewers, we then whittle the uh, application list down to about the top 100 proposals. And we have a selection committee of six outstanding scholars from different disciplines, and it changes annually. Uh, they read the 100 uh, proposals, uh, final proposals, and we bring them to the center for two days at the end of January. And they and I and the Vice President for Scholarly Programs and the Chair of the Scholarly Programs Committee from our board sit in a room for the full two days, um, and we go through each of the 100 proposals and uh, decide to whom we are going to, uh, at the end of that process, uh, offer fellowships. We also come up with an alternate list um, in case anybody uh, turns us down, although we have a, a, about an 85% yield rate in terms of those to whom we uh, offer fellowships who actually accept. And then the Vice President of Scholarly Programs has to make phone calls and make people's uh, day and, and year. Uh, our goal is to uh, offer a financial package that offers the fellow whole in terms of uh, their salaries. So we normally expect that the institution will come up with about half and will uh, come up with a stipend for the other half. Um, since we've really tried to diversify the representation of fellows and fellowships, um, sometimes we have people coming from institutions that simply can't afford any, uh, to put in anything, and we don't let money uh, become an obstacle. So you know, we'll cover that. That uh, is the situation. Um, successful proposals navigate really the tightrope between writing for reviewers in the discipline and also for an interdisciplinary committee. Uh, you're to write a thousand word narrative essentially, and therefore uh, it can't be solely jargon in the discipline because it would go through the interdisciplinary committee. It can't be too vague in general when it has the, uh, the scholars in the discipline. Uh, we ask for th three letters of recommendation, and we ask that they speak very directly to the proposal and to what the applicant will gain in the fellowship year. Typically, our fellows are not too early in the process of the project or too late in the process. So they really can uh, take advantage of the fellowship year to get a lot of the writing done. If it's very much at the inception, there's a lot more research to do. If it's too late in the process and it's just getting wrapped up, really they're not going to take advantage of the fellowship year to that extent. So we're looking somewhere in the middle, um, essentially. Most of our fellows are mid-career or senior, although we do have the sort of advanced assistant professors uh, as well who are working on a really compelling second book project. So, in short, and I'll conclude, and then Joy and I will be happy to take questions. Our fellowship program is really one of the most prestigious in the world. It's on par with um, uh, those at CASPIS and the Institute for Advanced Studies at Princeton. Um, the loyalty of our former fellows testifies to the transformative and immensely productive experiences that they had during their year at the center. And if your application is successful, I assure you 
that you will be an intellectual nirvana and will become a member of a lasting community of friends and colleagues. So thank you very much. I'll be happy to respond to questions as we'll do it. So uh, we have a little bit of time, I'm told, to stall very briefly as, um, as Jake, our technician here and program director, um, makes some, some shifts in the, uh, in the Zoom. Um, and uh, this is given, uh, certainly if you've been on fellowships, there's a lot to think about, about how to use the time wisely. Also, the points about um, what an application should look like, how it's directed. And then you have, both of you have some incredible um, broad gestures or broad, broad statements about the way that uh, you're servicing the humanities, seeing the humanities at service to a broader society, the sort of broader impact um, of that. So there's, there's a lot to talk about, um, but I'm going to open up to you first uh, as an opportunity to ask some questions if you have something. Um, thank you for the presentation. So I have a, um, what would sound like a very specific question, but it actually has some broad, um, I guess, resonances for a lot of people um, who might be international like I am. Mm -hmm. So I, I completed two um, postdoctoral fellowships, but um, I didn't qualify to apply for a ton of the, you know, the presidential fellowships, et cetera, because they required either permanent residency or, uh, you know, being a citizen. Um, and now I am a permanent citizen, and I'm just over eight years past my PhD. So in turn, this is a question regarding the ACLS fellowship, which uh, requires that you're not beyond eight years past your PhD and that you are a citizen. So that's quite a bit exclusionary for a lot of people who might take the time. Can we bring back my PowerPoint? So, because you don't have to be a citizen to apply. You can be a permanent resident. Yeah. Which, or DACA or, right. yeah. But by the time a lot of us who are internationals get their PhDs here, become permanent residents, after postdocs, we're not any longer within that eight year period. So one question I have is oh, whether there's flexibility in regards to, for instance, the postdoc years. In some disciplines, postdocs are treated as part of the training. So it's a practical question, but I'm wondering if, if that's a model, which it seems like it was based on the old school tenure track. Everybody gets a tenure track job right out of their PhD, and then by the eighth year, you should be maybe, uh, you know, then you should apply for this fellowship. <laughs> right. Know. But, you know, I, I did four years on the postdoc, which um, I'm just wondering if there is any sort of thoughts about that timeline. Like, it looked like you're considering some new fellowships based on the changing landscape of academia right now. Yeah, so the, so the, when I got to ACLS in 2019, there, the, th this is really regarding our, what we call in, internally the central fellowship, the ACLS fellowship. It's a little confusing because we call a lot of our fellowships ACLS fellowships, but the ones in various programs funded by Mellon or Luce or Getty or Carnegie, et cetera, um, you'll see on the website, you know, we try to list them in a coherent way. So what I'm about to say is only applicable to the ACLS endowment funded fellowship. And that is what most people think of when they think of applying to AC, you know, in, in kind of common parlance, the ACLS fellowship. So that's why I'm focusing on this one. Um, when I got to ACLS in 2019, they were set up in the following way. We awarded between, I guess in the prior five years, we'd awarded between 65 and 80 of them. Um, and they were divided in, it, the whole program was divided in thirds. You could apply to the assistant professor track, the associate professor track, or the full professor track. And to be totally honest with you, I got in and I said, well, there's no, like, where do you go if you're a contract faculty member or if you're an independent scholar? And the answer was, well, we don't exclude anybody. They just put in and we kind of guess 
where they belong in terms of time to degree and their scholarly productivity. And so nobody was excluded, and I want to underline that. But in practice, I think people correctly interpreted the labels as suggesting that tenure track scholars or tenure scholars were going to get the nod, you know? And that was reflected in our awardee list. We had very, very, very few independent scholars or contract faculty members or adjuncts in our list of awardees. So we started thinking right away in the fall of 2019 about how to shift this, and then COVID happened. And I talked with the board, and we said, look, we're, at a, we're in a situation where if you have a tenured job, it's not that life is roses, but you at least have, in, in, in most states, and again, I'm not glossing over all the complications with being a tenured faculty member in every state of the union right now, but um, let alone around the world, it's on clearly the most vulnerable people who don't have sustained employment, and that's people without tenure. So just since 2020, we've had this limitation on the eight years. And the reason we picked eight years, actually, although it looks like it's a tenure track hangover, it actually doesn't have anything to do with that. It has to do with the number of applications we could handle, um, given the staff we have. And we, pull, we, took as, we pushed it to as many years as we could accept without overwhelming program staff and reviewers. Um, so that, that's the eight year. That's exactly what's under consideration literally right now as we think about how to open up the competition to people with tenure again. So the results, that's why I said stay tuned. Um, we will have to make this call at some point this spring so that we can set up the competition and open it up, assuming we make the change this year. Um, it, this is a complicated conversation. It's involving reviewers, our board, our internal staff. Um, I can't, and I'm not promising that we're going to make the change this coming year, but it's likely. And I would say, if not this coming year, highly, highly likely the year after that. Um, and, and I guess the last thing I'll say is I, I think it was a great thing that we did to, you know, to focus on people without tenure for this period that has been so unsettled. And I confess to a little bit of a twinge because there are, there's so much need and there are so many strong applications. But I f also feel really strongly there are there, I mean, just unbelievably amazing projects, as Robert will know, because this is really, you know, that uh, I think the National Humanities Center, which I'm on the board, I should say, full disclosure, um, accepts, you know, many, many people with tenure, and the work is just incredible. So there's great moral force pushing us in the direction of opening it up, too. So please and, uh, and keep an eye out for that shift. Oh, I should also say in terms Robert, can I say one more thing sure. about our, um, because you reminded me I, uh, about two points I didn't make that you did very well. We, uh, just to reiterate, we too accept, you know, we, we cover our, um, in our society membership, not only uh, areas in the humanities, you know, fields and, and area studies and interdisciplinary areas in the humanities, but also the interpretive social sciences. So, um, you know, archaeology, anthropology, sociology, political, political science, actually, we have some not super quantitative ones, um, but not just political theorists either. Um, archaeology, um, economics, economic history. Uh, again, our, our rough rule of thumb is if you can be funded by the NSF, you're probably not going to make a strong ACLS um, applicant because we know that you know, funders for the hard science and uh, sciences and quant people um, and public policy people are thicker on the ground but we do fund uh, the, the, the social sciences as well. And you mentioned, uh, Robert, books and articles, uh, and, um, and we, are, we don't have a great track record yet of funding podcasts, apps, community-engaged products, um, exhibits, but we are thinking about how to do that because we believe that that's, and I mean, ASU is a great, we do look at your website and we look at the fruits of all of your, probably your research as we try to think about how to present what we will fund um, and then building our reviewer cadres so that they can adequately evaluate the work. Yeah, I would just speak up on that and say that we also are looking increasingly at collaborative projects as well. You know, in the era of digital humanities, it's a necessity yeah. we have a lot of digital humanities that publish us. And uh, this year we actually have a project and we're looking um, in terms of your pool and uh, those that we accept on fellowships uh, at collaborative projects as well as you know, the sort of more traditional projects. Yeah, it's a great example of why we're working on infrastructure because right now the fact 
system tends to reward, you know, reward single author monographs and peer reviewed articles. So we're very aware of that. So uh, we're not trying to push the envelope so far that we're rewarding word, work that then won't be rewarded in people's home institutions. And that's one of the reasons we feel it's so crucial to sustain um, a, a consistent line of, frankly, pushing um, and encouraging people to value a broader range of scholarly output. Other questions? Yeah. Um, I'm interested in how both of y'all are thinking long term in your organization's vision and addressing kind of the move to make the humanities more like the social sciences in terms of, you know, because now I'm being told, oh, I need to get grants in order to have grad students, <laughs> right? So if I want to bring on grad students. Like, I need, mean, like, in a sense, like, I need grants like that. And that started when I was in geography, so my PhD is in geography, but as a humanistic work. But a lot of it was, like, in geography, saying that, well, if you want to be like us, we have to be more like the scientists and have your own money that you need to bring with you in order to kind of build how you want to build as a research program. And so I'm wondering if your organization are kind of thinking through that, because I'm seeing that across the humanities, right, too. Like, some of those little things from the sciences of the STEM are kind of creeping over um, in terms of like, you know, um, not to go as far as say like, oh, we're going to go to soft money models versus you need to fund part of your, but I can see a lot of schools wanting that, you know, especially uh, where I came from in Florida, so, you know. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's, I mean, the, um, it, it, Part of the challenge, I think, and, and Robert, I'd love your thoughts on this too. I mean, part of the challenge of advocating for humanistic scholarship, in my view, just like advocating for liberal arts education, is that it's plural. You know, by definition, it's pluralistic. There are lots of different types of people, uh, lots of different motivations and goals. So to honor and advance all of them is the huge challenge. And I mean, one of the classic, you know, walls I bump into when I talk about valuing work other than monographs and articles is there's almost someone in the, almost always someone in the but what about books and articles? And I'm like, ah, oh, those are great. We will always support them. We're also interested in this other, but, but the, um, especially with, with, Humanists, I mean, in all seriousness, being under such intense threat and financial pressure, as you're indicating, it's an understandable reaction, a human reaction to say, but I'm doing this thing. Don't tell me you're interested in this other thing. And even if it's really we're trying to value a greater diversity of work. So I say this because I am happy to see uh, among, you know, humanistic and, and universities and among scholars, a welcoming of especially the kind of socially engaged and publicly responsible work that when I was a graduate student in the 90s was often looked down on by, I mean, I'm a classical studies PhD, but I had a lot of friends in comp lit and in history who wanted to do more publicly oriented work or socially impactful work. Sorry, I said impact. Um, I usually don't. Uh, I don't know how that came out, but and they were told not to, you know, because it wasn't serious, it wasn't scholarly. So to see the pendulum swing is good, but then your issue, you know, then we run into these problems. So all I can say is uh, we do our best to advocate with our uh, with our networks like the consortium um, and our associate members. We try to provide advice when we get contacted by deans or by faculty, by chairs as do many of our society executive directors like Paula Krebs at the MLA, to try to push back on those requirements when they're getting in the way of the work we want to do. Um, and that's our best, it's a kind of bully pulpit um, best response at this point. One thing I can say is you know, we, we would never require, um, require anything like that. You know? And occasionally we do get asked if, if um, you know, we will add to our application evidence that people are bringing other funding to it. You know that we're not going to go down that road. So, um, so that's a that's really what we can do at this point is and and lift up the work. Yeah, Robert, what about what do you think? Yeah, so I, I think I, I, I agree with everything you said. I, mean, I think both of us have kind of national holy pulpits, and both of us have been very active sort of pushing back um, uh, in terms of the devaluing of, of, of the humanistic enterprise and humanistic scholarship in the humanities generally. Um, and it was a challenge. I mean, our, our, our fellows typically run the gamut. Increasingly, we're seeing people uh, applying who really want to work on um, the crucial issues of the day, uh, you know, contemporary issues. And they're, 
they're approaching it from interdisciplinary perspectives, and they're not, they can't necessarily be pigeonholed in, in a single humanities discipline any longer. Right. And we welcome that. That's wonderful. We also are consider ourselves, if necessary for us, to consider ourselves as a home for um, the scholar who's working in 8th century Persian numismatics uh, and who is probably going to be writing for you know, 15 other people, uh, but who is really going to be advancing the discipline uh, in that area, that, that narrow area. And that's important too. Um, so we celebrate uh, the panoply of, of, uh, of all aspects of the humanities. We also recognize the intersections between the humanities and the sciences, and the science of technology, and the, the social sciences, and we have increasingly people working at the intersections uh, between these various disciplines, and uh, sort of changing the, challenging and changing the dimensions of these various disciplines. I think that's important too. Um, the funding mechanism, you know, it, it varies. We, it, it, I think it's problematic to uh, for universities to be looking at humanities scholars the same way they look at engineers. Uh, it's not the same thing. It's not uh, funded the same way. Uh, we don't, we're, we're generally speaking pretty cheap to uh, to universities. Um, you know, give us some books and just to write out in a nice computer, and we can get a lot of work done. We don't need uh, three million dollar startup packages. Um, so that's nice. Increasingly, we see institutions like NSF that want. Uh, for a fundable grant, a humanities component attached to it also. So I think there are a lot of opportunities that, have, that are out there for humanists to be working across disciplines uh, and to be working with colleagues in other fields. Um, and you know, getting grants is not, is not a bad thing, uh, but it shouldn't be a, 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 a requirement necessarily for advancing uh, in the humanities because that's just not necessarily what we do. I hope that answers your question. Uh, yeah, thanks, uh, both of you, for your comments. This is a question for Robert. Uh, the, the residential fellowship sounds very lovely. Um, and so I have some kind of accessibility questions to follow up on the points you were making about keeping people's salaries whole um, and you know potentially having the, uh, the partners come along as associates. Um, mm -hmm. So I guess two questions. One is, you mentioned helping with housing. I'm assuming that people handle, you know, if they can't afford a second rent on top of that. that. Um, and then also, are there any, like as amazing as the residential piece sounds, are there any conversations about creating a non-residential track that, you know, for folks who just can't leave home, that, you know, fly out once a take pieces of it. Like, what does that landscape look like? First one, challenge for prices have just skyrocketed over the past several years. We really do believe in, in, in the idea of the rest of the um, and you just know that in your application, that is fine, um, and you're, you're not downgraded by any means that you were just applying for the semester rather than a full year. We really do believe that one of the things that we presented is that intellectual community of which I spoke. And that, had, that is really, really significant. Um, and our board very strongly supports that. Uh, I think um, our residential fellowship is, is quite important. And you know, we stand by it. And we feel that the projects that are ultimately produced as a result of having that residential fellowship are sort of a testimony. Uh, to its significance, and we do follow surveys with our fellows. Um, uh, with after three years, after five years down the road, etc., and they all point to the significance of sort of that time away from their universities and how important it really was. 
Now, as you said, we try to make it a little bit easier by uh, doing these resident associate uh, positions. We, we try our best to find good child care that's needed uh, for our fellows also, and to sort of navigate that also. Uh, the challenge of the rents here is just that a challenge, and I've been working a lot um, with uh, the Research Triangle Foundation uh, as they're building up the Research Triangle Park, which is the largest research park in the country currently. They are building hotels and various housing because they're trying to keep people in the park rather than just them coming to work and then going um, uh, going to work for a little Raleigh or carry uh, for the evening. So we are trying to negotiate um, some uh, less expensive opportunities that are closer to the center, although Newark and Chapel Hill are only about 10 miles away, so it's not really not that bad. Uh, to date, unfortunately, we have not been able to supplement to the extent where um, typically well, um, the fellows will have to, you know, sort of uh, rent out their place or find some other means, uh, essentially, uh, in order to come. However, we do take that into consideration their financial needs when we are negotiating their stipends. It's not a fixed stipend across the board. It's a negotiable stipend. Uh, the standard that I gave you is just that. It's a standard. It's essentially, we'll come up with one half of the salary. We expect the institution to come up with the other half of the salary. But there's flexibility around that, uh, particularly if someone has um, sort of special circumstances, special needs. Um, we have, for example, uh, a scholar that, uh, from Russia this year, and a scholar from Nigeria. Um, the scholar from Russia just sort of snuck out of Russia to come. Um, and the scholar from Nigeria had no funding from his institution. We just cover everything. And we gave them both a uh, healthy stipend so that they can afford to live comfortably. We don't want anybody living in, uh, in poverty or in circumstances that that are basically going to distract them from the project that they've come to, to work on. So we'll work with you if that's what it calls for as much as we possibly can. Thank you. Okay, uh, we have time for one more question. Let me ask you just one, one thing real quickly. This is the obvious one, but we hopefully many people will apply. And um, there are a lot of applications. You see a lot of applications. You read through a lot of applications. So the obvious questions are, what, do you, what should applicants do to say, like, this is a good application to at least, not, it's not going to guarantee anything, but we'll get noticed, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah, go ahead, I'll follow up. Uh, well, it, that, first of all, I should say, evaluation so um, <laughs> so I can say that the truth and not be held accountable but no I'm not I don't mean it that way um, I just want to be clear I mean I don't have anything I don't have anything to do with the selection uh, the I, I think what so I now my colleagues uh, the program directors and and the program officers and then what I hear about the way they talk about review review committees and how they work uh, the I mean, I think Robert put it really well that it's a Tight walk, a, a tightrope walk between generalists and specialists. I would say that increasingly, you know, two things come out of the conversations that I hear. I mean, clarity is really important, and not a. The method or whatever it is. Really difficult, I think, especially for dissertation or early career scholars to do. Um, for you know, we've read and talked about at ACLS all kinds of studies that <laughs> that show, um, even through stylistic analysis, how emerging area points, you know, their main points in the middle of paragraphs or the end is, and so just if. You of suffering from that syndrome, get people to read it, pull out and put it at the top, you know, just really kind of think like a surgeon and, and pull, you know, re reorganize your 
um, your essay if you have a trace of a question about whether the value and impact of the of the work um, is not is not coming out, uh, whether it is or not. Uh, the second thing, along with clarity, um, is um, is generosity, kind of capaciousness and ambitious a a ambition, and I think that holds true um, regardless. As and I love your example, Robert. You know, even if you're working in a field where your audience is small, because you have a, spe a highly specialist contribution to make, uh, there's there is a way to show how it contributes. You know, with some thinking to um, making us think differently about the human condition. And don't be afraid to say that. Um, you know, you may have a technical argument to make. Great, make it. You know, show uh, the technical uh, side of the project if, you know, if, that, if that's appropriate for you. Um, but, you know, it, it, the, you're, you've picked this for a reason. <laughs> because it's going to change the way people think about thing. And expressing that in a language, it not only helps the application stand out, but it gives us more confidence that we're funding a scholar who's going to move out and make a difference, frankly. Whether it's in the classroom, or the graduate seminar, or with college, you have to be public humanists. Like, I mean, that's great if you are, great if you aren't, right? So I think don't, don't hesitate to, um, to couch your project in, in terms of your own scholarly, you know, your academic value, believe in the importance of what you're doing. Um, because, you know, that's, that's going to tell us a little bit about you um, as a thinker. Yeah, I would just, uh, I, I would echo all that. Uh, essentially, I think clarity is extremely important, being able to write for both specialists and generalists. Uh, that's extremely important also. The fact that, you know, we, we, the review committee, uh, and when we get in that room for two days, two solid days, and we're going and we're discussing each of those applications, you know, basically we're building the community. Um, and we talked to each other about, you know, we've, we've maybe chosen the first five or six or seven fellows, and then we're thinking about how other people that we're considering might sit with those other fellows. So maybe we go to the show, we've chosen six of the first eight or historians, and we start saying, oh, we need some other fields as well. Um, uh, so uh, all that is extremely important. But also, I think the letters of recommendation, we, we consider them very, very carefully. And, and the letter writers, what we're looking for in letter writers is that they're not just writing generic letters. Um, that they're really speaking to this particular project as divorced from perhaps previous projects and, and how, as Joy said, how it's really going to advance the field and uh, essentially how important it is that it's going to um, uh, make a mark uh, ultimately. And again, we're, we're building a residential program. We're building a cohort of people they're going to be working very closely with each other and holding each other accountable. They form all kinds of accountability groups, writing groups during the course of the year. They spontaneously form seminars. They spontaneously form reading groups. They spontaneously have happy hours and go out and socialize together. And it's nice. We're looking for people that can work well together and work well with others. Uh, we like to think that people leave their egos at the door at the National Humanity Center. And I can't tell you how many times after the process is completed and we've made the selections and we've sent out then the projections as well, how I'll get calls from people that are extremely well known in the field and we haven't accepted them. And they will call and essentially say, you know, don't you know who I am? And I will have to say, uh, yeah, you're wonderful in terms of work you've done, but you're perfect.
that Robert, I'm so sorry you get those phone calls. I leave people sometimes. Um, <laughs> it, it, I, I also. So you know, same thing happens, I think, with the program, program directors of AC. Sadly, the. Actually, we've taken a different approach to our letters of recommendation. Pulled out and rid of that requirement. Just require. You know, lots of reasons why. Um, but it is a, a bit of a difference in our approach. Otherwise, we have similar um, with specialists. Um, never just specialists, but the first round is more specialistic, and the second round is an interdisciplinary group um, that either come to our office in New York or Pennsylvania online. Um, but, um, but yeah, we, we, we are, have a different approach to letters at this point. So. Okay, well, thank you all for coming, and please join me in thanking. Thank you. And please apply.